Okay, we'll be waiting to see if anyone else uh, shows up for this, but we'll be starting in just a minute with a word of prayer. Yeah. Flash over your um, your mouse over the screen. You'll see down to the bottom. There'll be a, an option for a chat. I'm having everyone else, um, everybody else, ask questions through the chat. If they have any questions about it, and then um, and you can uh, join in and ask questions, and I'll see what I can do for you. Okay. Well. Let's start with the word of prayer, shall we? In the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, amen. Gracious God, Heavenly Father, we are thankful that we can get together this morning to study your word and get a greater understanding about the book of Revelation. We pray now, Lord, that you would grant us your Holy Spirit, that you may enlighten our hearts and minds to your word, that we may receive it, and be able to better explain the faith to others, to those around us. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Okay, so... The uh, very first, you know, this is going to be seven keys to understanding Revelation. Seven things you really need to know about um, if you're going to understand the book of Revelation in any reasonable sense and not go off into all kinds of crazy theories and the like. Uh, one of the things we, we note, yeah, I've already disinfected my hands, uh, is that uh, you need to know. First key is understanding the end of the world in the rest of the Bible. The book of Revelation is a vision, and therefore, because it's a vision, it should be interpreted as a vision. Everything in there is symbolic, um, unless there's a good reason to interpret it literally. Now, St. John certainly saw everything literally, but uh, the things he saw were mostly symbolic. Um, also, in Revelation, another thing you understand of the whole of the, you, need, you need to understand the clear passages of the Bible, and that Revelation overall is a, um, it's a full, uh, it summarizes all of Scripture into, uh, into one book, okay, and it does this several times, all right, so anyway, with that, uh, let's start looking at some of the scriptures uh, that help us understand the book of Revelation better. And, and the most, probably the most important uh, part of the Bible you need to understand, to understand the book of Revelation, is Exodus. Because uh, the book of Re Revelation is the Christian's Exodus. Okay? As I said, if you have any questions, feel free to... Uh, uh, to uh, Use the chat button to ask questions, uh, and we'll, we'll, we'll take care of that. All right, so uh, we're going to turn to Exodus chapter 7, okay? Uh, you, need not, you need to understand Exodus chapters, uh, the Exodus to understand and the plagues, understand the book of Revelation. So Exodus chapter 7, uh, going down to verse 14, uh, says, And the Lord said to Moses, Pharaoh's heart is stubborn. He refuses to let the people go. Go to Pharaoh in the morning um, as he's going out to water and station yourself between him and the bank of the Nile. Uh, he's not working on mine. <laughs> it's people, uh, Are you drinking? You got your picture on? Oh, I took mine off. Hey, uh, Karen, did you turn your, did you mute your phone? What? Can you mute your phone, your iPad? I'm trying okay. to, it's not letting me. Okay. I'm mute. <laughs> okay, so we're in chapter uh, seven here of, of, of Exodus, right? And so he, you know, Moses uh, goes to uh, Pharaoh and he, the very first plague is the plague of blood. And he, you know, he, and it infects all of Egypt, right? Uh, there, there's, there's all the, all the water and all of Egypt turns to blood, right? And you'll, you'll see this come up again later on. Hey, Peter. 
Uh, you'll, you'll see this come up again later on in the book of Revelation. Uh, but all of Egypt gets affected by, by, by the plague of the blood, right? All right. Then if you go to Exodus, uh, and of course, you know, things move on. Exodus chapter 8 then goes to the next plague, right? The Lord said to Moses, go to Pharaoh and say to him, thus says the Lord, let my people go that they may serve me. But we refuse to let them go. Behold, I will smite your whole territory with frogs, and then I will swarm with frogs, which will come up and go into your house and your bedroom and on your bed, and in the houses of your servants and your people, and in your ovens and your kneading bowls. So the frogs will come up, and your people and all your servants. Right? Um, and so, you know, frogs is the next big thing. And uh, they go over all of Egypt, right? Uh, throughout the all throughout the um, you know, the Nile, wherever there's water, it's going. They're going in all the homes and everywhere else, and uh, for and so for a little bit, Pharaoh goes, "All right, you got me. I repent." But very quickly, once all the frogs go away, you know, like many people, uh, when, when God delivers them, he hardens his own heart. Right? He hardens his heart, um, and of course, a lot of people like that today. You know. Maybe a lot of people are turning to the Lord right now with the, with the coronavirus. Uh, when all this is over, poof, where will they be? Right? They'll, they'll forget about God just as quickly. All right. And then we go to the, to the third plague, you know, chapter 8, verse 16. And the Lord said to Moses, say to Aaron, stretch out your staff and strike the dust of the earth, that it may become gnats through all of the land of Egypt. And they did so. And Aaron stretched out his hand of his staff, struck the dust of the earth, there were gnats on man and beast, and all the dust of the earth came up gnats through all the land of Egypt. Right. Uh, so now again, so we see this gnats, and there's this kind of type of pestilence here. And again, all of Egypt, right? It affects everybody. It affects the Egyptians, it affects the Israelites, just like the frogs, just like the blood, right? Nobody was excluded. Uh, from from this um, plague of of, of the um, gnats, okay, uh, and then of course Pharaoh goes, oh please help, please help, and then it stops, and then he hardens his heart again against against Moses, uh, and not letting God's people go. All right, and then we go down to verse twenty one. We're still uh, we're in chapter eight of, of Exodus. Right, chapter 8 of Exodus, you're following along. Um, if you're not let my people go, behold, I will send swarms of insects on you and on your servants and on your people and your houses. And the house of the Egyptians will be full of swarms of insects and also the ground in which they dwell. But, and this is important, on that day I will set apart the land of Goshen where my people are living, that no swarms of insects will be there in order that you may know that I, the Lord, am in the midst of the land. And I will put a division between my people and your people. Tomorrow this sign will occur. Right? Now, this is really big, right? So the first three plagues affect everybody. The Egyptians, the Israelites, you know, no distinction between people. But now, the swarm of insects, right, there is a, um, there's a distinction between God's people and the Egyptian people. And this is very important when we get to the book of Revelation, because you will see this come up again there. Okay. And of course, uh, the Pharaoh again repents, and then he hardens his heart. All right. So now we're going to move on down to chapter nine. Okay. Um, chapter nine, starting at verse one. And the Lord said to Moses, go to Pharaoh and speak to him. Thus says the Lord, the God of the Hebrews, let my people go that they may serve me. For if you refuse to let them go and continue to hold them, behold, the land of the Lord will come a very severe pestilence on your livestock, which are in the field, on the horses, on the donkeys, and the camels, on the herds, and the flocks. But the Lord will make a distinction between the livestock of Israel and the livestock of Egypt, that nothing will die of all that belongs to the sons of Israel. So here again, we got this, uh, this distinction. We got this pestilence that falls upon all the livestock, but only on the livestock of the Egyptians, not God's people. Uh, God is making a distinction here. And uh, so you'll be able to see who is God's people and who aren't God's people. 
Uh, and uh, you know, after the, this happens, Pharaoh hardens his heart. Right? He will not let God's people go. It's kind of kind of a regular theme here. You know, Pharaoh hardens his heart. You know, God sends another plague, trying to get his, everybody's attention here. Uh, so then we go to chapter 9, verse 8. Then the Lord said to Moses and Aaron, Take for yourselves a handful of soot from a kiln, and let the, Moses throw it toward the sky in the sight of Pharaoh. And let it come like fine dust over the land of Egypt. And become boils, breaking out with sores on man and beast throughout all the land of Egypt. So he took soot from a sick kiln, stood before Pharaoh, and Moses threw it toward the sky. And became boils, breaking out with sores on man and beast. The magicians could not stand before Moses because of all the boils, right? Uh, and again, these boils, uh, there was just, again, there's a distinction here between God's people and the Egyptians, right? Uh, not as explicit here in this, in this one, but it, it's, it's fairly implicit in, in the wording. Um, and again, you know, this is a plague, uh, you know, boils, and we'll see, we'll see this coming up again in our, um, I call it my... It's the sixth key to understanding Revelation, right? And when we get to that later on. But you know, check out, notice that there's the spoils. It only affects the Egyptians. Um, and you know, God struck them with the pestilence, and, but and uh, they will not let, still Pharaoh, you know, hards his heart, doesn't let God's people go. All right. Moving on to verse 18 in chapter 9. Oh, do note, and, and, and on the plagues of boils, now the Lord hardens Pharaoh's heart, right? So before it was all Pharaoh. Pharaoh, you know, in and of himself, hardens his heart against God, against Moses and God's people. Uh, and I guess if you, if you do that long enough, you know, you see here, God hardens Pharaoh's heart now, right? Because God's going to show him, he's going to use Pharaoh to show his glory not to the Egyptians and to the world, that you know, who's in control here? Who's doing this, right? He is, you know, and while he's doing all this, of course, when God's striking down the Egyptians with all these different plagues, you know, it's kind of noticing that the, a lot of these different plagues are also uh, were gods of Egypt, you know, frogs, gnats, you know, livestock, right? You know, they, they worshiped all these things. And God's like, huh, I'll show you. <laughs> you know, worship these? They're going to go against you here. All right, so, uh, so the Lord hardens the Pharaoh's heart in verse eight, in, in the plague of the boils. Now in verse 18, Behold, about this time tomorrow I will send a very heavy hail, such as net seen in Egypt from the day it was found until now. Now therefore send, bring your livestock and whatever you have in the field to safety. Every man and beast that is found in the field and is not brought home when the hail comes on down to them will die. The one among the servants of Pharaoh who feared the word of the Lord made his servants and livestock flee the houses or flee into the houses, but he who paid no regard of the word of the Lord left his servants and livestock in the field. Now the Lord said to Moses, stretch out your hand toward the sky, and hail may fall in the land of Egypt, and on a man and beast, and every plant of field throughout the land of Egypt. All right, so uh, this hail came down, uh, you know, as, as, as God predicted, and as he warned. And we do note, hey, you know, some of these people are starting to pay attention. To Moses, you know, they believe Moses's word, word of the Lord from Moses, and some of the Egyptians said <laughs> they they gathered their flocks and their their livestock. Uh, they probably went and maybe even harvested uh, the barley. Uh, the ones that believed, uh, but of course, the ones who didn't believe, the Egyptians who you know who didn't believe God's warning from from Moses, uh, they left their animals out in the field. All their their, their barley was out in the field; it was ready to be picked. Uh, but it was all destroyed by the hail. Right, so the hail came down, struck man and beast, um, and, and, and the plants, the field. So, you know, all that stuff was destroyed. Uh, Goshen, though, again, uh, we, we see here, Goshen was spared, where God's people, that's the kind of the upper Nile area, you know, we're, we're along the northern part of, of, of Egypt, along the Mediterranean there. Uh, that's where God's people were in Goshen. And, uh, and so uh, that area was spared, the, the hail. So God makes, you know, the Lord makes a distinction between the Israelites and the Egyptians, right? Uh, and again, Pharaoh's heart was hardened uh, by this action and would not let God's people go. 
All right, we move into chapter 10. Um, starting at verse 1, the Lord said to Moses, Go to Pharaoh, for I have hardened his heart and the heart of his servants, and I may perform these signs of mine among them. And you may tell in the hearing of your son, your grandson, how I made the mockery of the Egyptians, and how I performed my signs among them, that you may know that I am the Lord. All right, so uh, this sign, these are signs for us. This is a sign for the, for the Israelites. It's a sign for God's people, the church. You know, is, is the Lord hardened Pharaoh's heart now? Because Pharaoh, you know, Pharaoh has been hardening his heart against the Lord all this time. Now God says, okay, I'm hardening your heart now too. Uh, so he would be an object of, uh, of, of something for us to learn from. You know, don't, don't do what Pharaoh does and then says no what. Uh, and so now uh, God is sending the locusts here in chapter 10, right? And uh, remember the, the barley was, was ruined uh, by, the, by the hail, but there was still the wheat and the spelt. They were left safe. Right? Well, now what even was left of that, the locusts are going to get, right? God's going to, you know, it's we have this total destruction of the land here, piece by piece, you know, uh, going along. And uh, again, this is kind of, you know, you'll see this happening when we get to the book of Revelation. But if you don't see it here and understand that uh, Revelation is the church's exodus, right? Um, and that's why the exodus of the, of, of, for the Israelites is important for us because it is, it, is it is an image for us to understand what's going on in the world today and, and, and the world if we, if we continue to come closer to the last day. Right. Okay. So uh, the locusts go and they do everything and they only tear up all, all of Egypt, but leave Goshen along, alone now. Okay. Finally, then, um, you know, and again, the Lord hardened Pharaoh's heart with this because he would not let the people go. Going down to verse 21, and we get darkness, right? Uh, darkness covers the land uh, for several days. Darkness you can feel. I don't know if you maybe you've been into a cave where they uh, turn on all the lights. And it's kind of like, wow, it's, it's presence of the weight of the darkness falls upon you there. Um, and so uh, darkness falls upon uh, the land of the Egyptians. Again, a Goshen, we assume here doesn't say it explicitly, is spared, you know, separating God's people from the Egyptian people. Okay. Again, a theme that's going to be coming up in the book of Revelation. But you understand that. Of course, darkness, you know, darkness is, is, is like the second to last plague before the end, right? And we'll see that, that theme of darkness coming up as we get to the other scripture passages um, talking about the end of the world so we can understand what's going on and how to recognize these things. All right. And finally, God, we have the last plague, right? I'm going to bring upon the Pharaoh. One more plague I'll bring on Pharaoh in Egypt. And after that, this is chapter 11, verse 1. Um, and after that, he will let you go from here. When he lets you go, you will surely drive you out from here completely. Uh, going down, of course, this is the plague of the firstborn, right? At midnight, chapter verse 4, I'm going, to, I'm going out into the midst of Egypt, and all the firstborn in all the land of Egypt shall die. The firstborn of Pharaoh who sits on his throne, even the firstborn of a slave girl who's behind a millstone, all firstborn cattle as well. will be a cry in Egypt, which has never been before, and will never be again. And so, uh, but to escape the plague, right? The way to escape, you know, this really actually falls upon would fall upon the, the Israelites in Goshen and in Egypt unless you do what the Lord says, right? There, there's there's an escape from the last plague, and that is you take a year old lamb, right? You celebrate the Passover, take the year old lamb you know, in the evening, on the tenth day, right? Slit its throat, take the blood. Put it on the doorpost and on the mantle of your door. And if that's on your door, whether you're an Egyptian or an Israelite, if that's on the door, if you believe God's word, if you trusted God's word and had the blood there on the door and followed God's instructions, uh, the angel of death would pass over you, right? Um, and you know how much though is like that, you know, for for the world. You know, a lot of people say they're Christians, uh, but if you, if, you know, if they don't really believe. Jesus died for their sins and trusted him alone, you know. It doesn't matter whether you said you're a Christian, you know, the matter said you said you're a Lutheran or Roman Catholic or whatever else. If you don't have faith in the blood of the Lamb, that is a Jesus, um, you're going to be judged right along with the rest of the world, 
It's like the Egyptians. You know, somebody, you know, towards the end says, you know, hey, you know, I heard about this Jesus. I don't want to, you know, go to hell. Uh, I'm going to put my trust in him. They're going to be saved. It's like the Egyptians uh, who, uh, you know, believed God's word through Moses. They even left some of the Egyptians that believed the word of the Lord. They left with the uh, Israelites when the Israelites finally left. All right, so that's that's the book of, of, of Exodus and, and the, the, the plagues. And if you don't understand these plagues, you don't give a good understanding and know what these plagues are. Um, when we get to the to, the, to Revelation itself, uh, you're going to be lost. You're going to go, what, what are all these different things that are going on? You're, but if you, if you remember these plagues, you're going to like, oh, wait, I remember that. That was, in, that was over in Exodus. And now it's happening in this. Slightly different way, though, but the, but the images are pretty much the same. All right, so now let's take a look, a look at somewhere else where the end of the world is described and, and with the and, and the, clearly in the Bible, uh, Isaiah chapter 24. All right, okay. So uh, Isaiah chapter 24, beginning with the first verse, behold, the, the Lord lays earth waste, devastates it, distorts its surface, scatters its inhabitants, and the people will be like the priest and uh, the servant like his master, the maid like her mistress, the buyer like the seller, the lender like the borrower, the creditor like the debtor, the earth will completely be laid waste and completely despoiled. For the Lord has spoken his word. The earth mourns and withers, the world fades and withers, and the exalted people of the earth fade away. Right? Uh, the earth is polluted by its inhabitants for transgressed laws, violated statutes, broke the everlasting covenant, and therefore a curse devours the earth, and those who live on it are held guilty. Therefore, the inhabitants of earth are burned, and few men are left. All right. uh, so here we got a little, little bit of description here in Isaiah chapter 24 of, of, of the last days, of things that are going to be happening. Uh, if we go down to verse uh, 21 of Isaiah, chapter 21, or short, chapter 24, verse 21 and 22, uh, it reads, So it will be on that day that the Lord will punish the host of heaven on high, and the kings of the earth. They will be gathered together like prisoners in a dungeon. We can find in prison, and after many days they will be punished. And the moon will be abashed, and the sun ashamed. For the Lord of hosts will reign on Mount Zion and in Jerusalem, and his glory will be before his elders. All right, so here we get a picture in Isaiah of, of the last day of, of, of judgment. Um, and the Lord, uh, you know, he gathers together uh, the peoples of the earth and the, those who, re who reject him and reject Jesus uh, for punishment. Uh, we also again see that that moon. You remember over in Exodus, the second to last plague was you know the sun turned dark. And here in verse 20, um, Isaiah 23, 24, 23, the moon's abashed, the sun's ashamed, right? So you know, darkness will come. You know, so if you're walking along one day and all of a sudden you know, there wasn't an eclipse planned and boom, you know, the sun's dark, right? Or if it's nighttime, that the, the moon becomes you know, like blood and dark, and all the stars in the sky go dark. You know, look up, Jesus is coming, right? Uh, so that's a very big theme uh, of, of, of the last day is, is, is darkness before reflecting uh, that last, second to last um, plague upon uh, the Egyptians. All right, uh, turn to Isaiah 34. I'm doing this on my computer so I can get to it quickly. I'm cheating. Okay, so Isaiah 34, uh, verse 4. All right, and it says, All the world, all the hosts of heaven will wear away, and the sky will be rolled up like a scroll, and their host will also wither away, as the leaf withers from the vine, or as one, one withers from a fig tree, right? Um, and so again, we got this whole thing of, of uh, things turning dark again, right? Uh, was there verses before that, you know, God brings his wrath against the nations at the, at the end, you know, we, we are oftentimes so afraid of, you know, the Antichrist, right? Uh, and, you know, Antichrist, you know, waging, uh, you know, wars and, you know, World War Three. you know, sometimes we get this idea of World War Three, and that's the, that's the end of the world. Um, you know, nations against nations. When, you know, nations against nations is just, uh, you know, those are just preludes, right? The last world war is the world, right, the Antichrist and, and his armies, versus the church and the Lamb, Jesus Christ. You know, they're waging war against the church. Um, and of course, you know, here, you know, uh, verse uh, 
to you know, Isaiah 34, uh, to you know, his wrath uh, against all of his armies, utterly destroyed them. He's given them a little bit of slaughter. Uh, we'll see this later on in the end of Revelation. Uh, slain, thrown out, carcasses will give their stench, mountains drenched in your blood. Uh, you will see all that in, in the book of Revelation. So here it is in you know, the Old Testament. You don't see this here. Uh, verse 5, my sword is satiated in heaven, right? Uh, you know, we'll see that later in Revelation 19, the sword coming out of Jesus' mouth, striking down people. Okay, um, and then uh, we'll turn to Ezekiel chapter 38. You can see what that's going on there with the end of the world. Thirty-eight, um, eighteen to twenty. All right, uh, when you say the wicked, you surely die. That's not it. Isaiah, oh, I'm in Ezekiel, sorry. Ezekiel 38. Starting at verse 18. 18 through um, 20, we have this Gog uh, comes up against the land of Israel. Um, and again, this is kind of later also described uh, several times in the book of Revelation. We'll see it there. Uh, we're hearing it in Gog is basically the world versus God's people, right? Um, my fear will mount up in my anger and my zeal against the blazing wrath. I declare that on that day, there will be surely a great earthquake in the land of Israel and fish of the sea, the birds in heaven, the beasts, the field, and all the creeping things on the earth. And all the men are in face will shake at my presence. The mountains will be thrown down. The steep pathways will collapse and every wall will fall to the ground. I shall call for a sword against him under all my mountains, declares the Lord God. And you know, every man's sword will be against his brother. Pestilence with blood, I shall enter into judgment with him. And I shall rain on him and on his troops and the many peoples who are with him. A torrential rain of hailstone, fire, brimstone. And I shall magnify myself, sanctify myself, and make myself known in the sight of any nations. And they will know I am the Lord. All right. So uh, here again, you know, we see this thing of this, this coming last a great battle. Uh, you don't need to worry about the end of the world with uh, nations fighting against nations. Those are just preludes. Uh, you know, the last big battle on earth is God versus the nations. Right? Who do you think is going to win this? Right? Well, you know, God tells us right here. He's going to win this. Right? All right. Where else can we go to? Uh, Daniel chapter 7. Uh, verse 13. All right, verse 13, um, here we go. I kept looking into night visions, and behold, with the clouds of heaven, one like a son of man was coming. And he came up to the ancient of day, which was presented before him. And he was given a dominions and glory and a kingdom, and all the nations and peoples in every language might serve him and his dominions from everlasting to dominion, which should not pass away. And his kingdom is one, which should not be destroyed. All right, uh, and so here we see the son of man was coming, right? With the clouds of heaven, right? You see somebody coming down the clouds of heaven, right? And all his angels and whatnot. Um, that's the last day. That's our Lord Jesus Christ coming. Right? Look for these. Look for this happening in the book of Revelation. It happens more than once. It should also be in one of the keys in Revelation. So anyway, you need to see this in Revelation and in, in Daniel uh, here. Um, that um, you know, the last day, Jesus comes with the clouds. All right. Also in Daniel chapter twelve. Uh, we see this chapter throwing at verse 1. Now at that time, Michael, and a great prince who stands guard over the sons of your people, will arise. And there will be a time of distrust such as never occurred since there was a nation until that time. And at that time, your people, everyone who's found and written in the book, will be rescued. And many of those who sleep in the dust of the ground will awake. These to everlasting life, but others to disgrace and everlasting contempt. All right? So um, there we go. Again, uh, last day, right? Um, great distress, and then there's the resurrection. Right? On the last day, you know, how do you know it's the last day? You see people flying up out of the graves, uh, as, then, then you know, this is it, right? Don't need to look for anything else. Uh, Jesus is coming. All right. Where else do we need to turn to? Zechariah chapter 12. 
if y'all have any questions, you can you know type them in down in your chat box towards the bottom. You'll see a little thing that says chat. Um, I have everybody muted because it just doesn't sound good with people talking. <laughs> All right. Uh, but Zechariah chapter 12 at verse 10. All right. And I will pour out on David, house of David on the inhabitants of Jerusalem the spirit of grace and supplications. They will look on me whom they have pierced. They will mourn for him as one mourns for an only son, and they will weep bitterly over him like the weeping, bitter weeping over a firstborn. And that day will be great mourning in Jerusalem, like the mourning of Hadjadrimen in the plain of Megiddo. Right? Uh, and land will mourn every family by itself, and so forth. Okay, so again, um, you know, we'll see this several times. Uh, in, in, clearly in the New Testament, Jesus tells us, you know, he's, he's going to come again. They will look on him whom they have pierced. Right, of course, when he's when he's crucified, you know, there he gets. There, that's when he is pierced. I mean, I looked up him and, and saw him. And of course, many in Jerusalem did mourn Jesus. That death it wasn't all the Jews. Uh, it was, you know, mainly uh, the Jewish leadership and others. You know, and Jewish people that were uh, motivated by by the Jewish leadership to crucify Jesus. Uh, but here, particularly, of course, is kind of again the last day. You know, anytime you see a picture of Jesus coming at the clouds, right? He's also coming as looking at the one who's pierced, right? So Jesus still bears when he comes again. You'll know it. Uh, you'll know who that is really Jesus because he'll be bearing the scars of his honor when he was crucified, right? Someone says they're Jesus. Well, let me see the scars, right? I'll believe you. But I'm as soon as I, just like Thomas, right? Thomas is doing actually a pretty good thing for us. Uh, we'll act like him on the last day. Or if anybody says they're Christ and they don't bear the scars of Jesus on his hands and feet and side, it's not Jesus. He's not coming with the clouds. It's not Jesus, right? Uh, so we look for that, all right? Then Joel. Joel is another big uh, one for um, end of the world, right? Kind of clear uh, passages here. So uh, Joel chapter 2, all right? Uh, following. And for the first one, blow a trumpet in Zion, and sound a alarm on my holy mountain. Let all the inhabitants of the land tremble, for the day of the Lord is coming, surely is near, a day of darkness and gloom, a day of clouds and darkness. As a dawn is spread over the mountain, so it will be a great and mighty people. There has never been anything like it, nor will it be like it after to the years of many generations. Fire consumes before them, and behind them a flame burns. The land is like the garden of Eden before them, a desolate wilderness behind them. Nothing at all escapes them. Right? Their appearance is like the appearance of horses and like war horses, so they run. The noise is chariots. They leap on tops of the mountains like a crackling of flame and fire consuming the stubble, like a mighty people arranged for battle. Before them, the people are in anguish. All faces turn pale. Right? Um, and so this is kind of like the, this is the gathering of, of the armies of the world coming upon you know, God's people. You know, God is gathering them for the last great big battle, not against man against man, but against man or well, against the church and his lamb, uh, our Lord Jesus Christ. All right, so one big thing, I go down to verse 10. Um, Before them, the earth quakes, the heavens tremble, the sun and moon grow dark, and the stars lose their brightness. And the Lord utters his voice before his army, and surely his camp is very great. So, you know, the Lord has his camp too, right? When Jesus returns, he returns with all of his holy angels. We see that in 1 Thessalonians, which we'll get to in a minute, right? Uh, for the day of judgment. And again, we have this thing of, of darkness, right? Uh, but we have this thing. Um, uh, for, um, I'm just getting close to 40 minutes here, so we're going to end up pretty soon. Uh, but, you know, there's a, yet even now, return to me with all your heart of fasting, weeping, and mourning, and rend your hearts and not your garments. Return to the Lord your God, right? So all these signs out that we see, they're calling us to uh, repent, right? The coronavirus is calling us to repent of our sins, everybody, you know, Christian, not Christian, and turn to the Lord. All right. I only have a couple of minutes left. Uh, so we're not going to get all to the rest of the um, passages here, but let's go ahead and turn to some, some, some New Testament ones. Uh, so Matthew chapter 24, 24, verse 29, uh, Jesus tells us, but immediately after the tribulation of those days, and in Matthew 24, the whole thing there is, is a, you know, it's two things. One is the descriptions of the coming of the end of the world, wars, rumors of wars, right? 
Uh, and then there's the destruction of Jerusalem, which happened in 70 AD, which is still in the world sign for us, like, hey, be prepared. Um, but then also it goes back to the very end. Immediately before, after the tribulation days, the sun will be darkened, the moon will not give its light, the stars will fall from the sky, the powers of heavens will be shaken, and then a sign of man will appear in the sky. And all the tribes of the earth will mourn, and they will see the Son of Man coming on the clouds of the sky with great power and great glory. And he will send forth his angels with a great trumpet, and they will gather his elect from the four winds from one end of the earth to the other. Right? And a great trumpet here is the seventh trumpet, not one of the other six ones that are there in Revelation. This is the end. This is the last one, the great trumpet, right? And again, how do you know? You look up. Hey, here comes Jesus, right? You know it's the end of the coming. Uh, turn to Mark chapter 13 now, verse 24. I got pretty much the same thing as in Matthew there, uh, 24. In those days after the tribulation, the sun will be darkened. So sun darkened, right? It's, it's, you know, unnaturally darkened, right? We're not talking about an eclipse here. We're talking supernatural darkness, just like it was over the land of Egypt, right? Three days, you know, we, all, we had that, that total eclipse just a couple of years ago, right? Right? Just a small strip of the earth was, was darkened there, and it was only happened for you know, total darkness for, for a few minutes, and then it you know, went away pretty quickly. This is not uh, an eclipse. This is supernatural darkness. Um, and again, we see Christ uh, coming uh, with, with the clouds. Um, and let's turn to First Thessalonians 4.16. Right. Uh, and it tells us, The Lord himself will descend from heaven to cloud, shout, the voice of the archangel and the trumpet of God, and the dead in Christ shall rise first. And then we who are alive and shall remain and caught up the air with them. The clouds meet the Lord in the air, and we shall be of the Lord, and therefore comfort one another with these words. Right? Uh, so there's no secret resurrection. There's no secret second coming of the Lord. Uh, when the Lord comes, you know, he says, you're going to see him coming. There's the, there's the last trumpet blast, right? Christ comes out, all of his holy angels, dead in Christ rise first. We're transformed into our new resurrected bodies and meet the Lord in the air. Uh, last one we're going to do is Second Peter, chapter 3, verse 10. Um, and again, it tells us the day of the Lord will come like a thief in which the heavens will pass away for war, the elements will be destroyed with intense heat, the earth and its works will be burnt up. It's so all these things um, are destroyed in this way. What sort of people ought you to be? And conduct yourself in holy contact, conduct in godliness, looking for and hastening the coming of the day of God. Um, so there you go. Uh, that's another description of the end of the world. And um, and that way, you know, we, you know this is going to happen, okay? Um, it's, it's going to be devastation, total devastation on that day. So you don't need to worry about it. All right, so if you don't have these things, you know, in the, in the midst of your mind, when you're studying Revelation, you're not going to understand what's going on, right? Uh, you're going to see all these elements taking place in Revelation. And Revelation really kind of summarizes the whole Bible uh, from Genesis uh, all the way up to Jude. It, take, it covers different portions of time. And uh, you'll see all these themes coming up in the book of Revelation in symbolic form, right? You're going to see uh, the separation of God's people versus the people of the world who reject Jesus, right? You're going to see some form of the plagues of, 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 of Exodus upon the world in some symbolic form uh, taking place there. And so you'll be able to recognize that at that time. Okay. So anyway, there you go. Uh, any last questions? There's, there's a chat box down at the bottom of your uh, screen. And if you wanted to type something or ask a question, uh, you can do that real quick or anytime during these Bible studies. Um, okay. Let's see anyone asking any questions. Oh, yeah, Peter, go ahead. Can you type it? Okay. Well, I, 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 I unmuted you. Go ahead. Okay. Can you hear me now? I can hear you. Okay. I was just wondering, is Revelation basically written to the people at that time or this time primarily? I mean, a lot of things that seem to be in Revelation is written to the people at that time for the tribulation they were going through. Is that true or is that something... You understand? It's, it's, it's one of those great Lutheran both ends. 
Uh-huh. <laughs> you know, it was certainly written for the people of the time that John was, um, you know, the, the Lord was revealing this to John to, okay? And they, they certainly experienced some of that stuff, but also a lot of stuff in Revelation uh, is for the time of the church, okay? Uh, so it's going to cover, you know, it was there for, to their comfort, but it's also for, for our comfort and strength as well. And, and we'll, we'll get more into that as we uh, dig into the other keys of Revelation. But yeah. Uh, and and do, you, do you believe Revelation was written after the fall of Jerusalem or before? I mean, 70 AD, was it written after 70 AD or before? Well, that's a good question. <laughs> okay, yeah. And uh, I, yeah, I, it's... I'm not 100% sure, but I'd, I'd probably go with before. Okay. I, I think it's an early date. Yeah, I, I I tend to believe that too. But I, like you said, it's very up to, you know, but I was just curious about your, you know, where you're coming from. But thank yeah. you. Yeah. Well, yeah, it depends, you know, when John was in exile, you know. Uh-huh. So, exactly. And so who knows? But, uh, that, but the message of Revelation is still for us today. Uh, even you know, if, if it had some immediate context, it certainly had some immediate context, and we'll and we'll get to that kind of when we, when we talk about the seven churches. Uh, some, uh, but yes, yeah, it is definitely for uh, for the people of the day, but it's also for us today too to understand this. These right. Things. And uh, Christians should not be afraid of it. Uh, it is a book of great comfort for us as Christians. You know, if Jesus is our Savior, we we don't have anything to worry about. Not that we won't undergo some of the things that's in Revelation. But, you know, we're, we're looking for the Lord to come, and we know where we're going to end up when all of it's over and done. So, Amen. All right. All right. Hey, we're going to have a, let's have a little quick closing prayer, and um, I'm not sure which day we're going to do this again. I'm going to do, do, we're going to do this, I guess we'll probably do this weekly. So next uh, next Thursday morning, um, we'll, we'll have this again. And we will be discussing the second part of, of Revelation, the second key, which is the end of the world. If you don't, if you can't recognize the end of the world, Revelation is not going to make any sense to you. Are you going to make a mess out of interpreting a book of Revelation? So, <laughs> so next next week uh, we'll we'll discover we'll, we'll go through the book of Revelation, talking about the end of the world, the last day. Uh, if you can't identify that, which I hope you, uh, looking at the stuff we looked at elsewhere in the Bible describing the last day, you'll be able to identify the last day in the book of Revelation. I'll just give you a clue. It happens seven times. <laughs> seven times the end of the world is described. So we'll discuss that yeah. next week. So let's have a little, we'll close with the uh, Lord's Prayer and uh, God's blessings on your day. Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. And uh, the Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious unto you. The Lord have his countenance upon you and grant you peace. Amen. All right, guys. Thanks for showing up. God's blessings.